Hello, and thank you for joining us today for this webinar on incorporating digital measures and endpoints into clinical trials, key regulatory considerations, brought to you by Script and sponsored by Bioformis. My name is Janelle Hart. I'm a managing editor at Sightline, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we jump into the presentation, let's go over some housekeeping items. First, if at any time you're having technical difficulties, click on the tester connection button, and this will take you to a connection checker and frequently asked questions page. If you're experiencing any technical issues, there is a chat now function to contact the support team for assistance. Want to enlarge the presentation? Just click the maximize icon or drag the lower right-hand corner of the presentation window to enlarge. If you have any questions, we want to hear from you. To ask your presenter a question, simply type it into the question window on the bottom of your screen and then hit submit. We'll answer your questions after the webinar via email. Because we know you'll want to listen to this webinar again, this, today's session is being recorded and, we will, and it will be available to view on demand in about 48 hours. I would now like to introduce our speakers for today's session. We have Seth Kudzel, SVP of Quality Assurance and Regulatory Affairs at Bioformis. Seth leads the regulatory strategy for product services and solutions. His expertise in medical technology draws from roles with some of the industry's largest and most admires, admired companies, including Medtronic, Boston Scientific, Philips, Achille, and G Healthcare. We also have Tarek Yardibi, Director of Digital Science, Health Sciences at Takeda. Tarek leads fit for purpose digital technology search and verification, analytical and clinical validation, and deployment of digital services and endpoints across the organization. During his career, he had the opportunity to work in both medical device development and pharmaceutical digital health and data science initiatives in a number of industry leading companies, including D GE, Becton Dickinson, J&J, &J, and Decada. And with that, I'd like to hand things over. The discussion will be guided today by Doug Bergner, Senior Marketing Director. Doug, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Janelle, and hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us here today for this. It's uh, this topic that we have, I think, is uh, quite relevant in the modern state of things in life sciences. Digital measures, digital endpoints, all of these technologies that keep uh, coming about and popping up incorporated into both drug development and the, uh, the real world settings are, it seems, really promising. There's a lot of potential, yet at the same time, there is, uh, I would say, confusion and uncertainty about exactly what some of these things are, and honestly, some ambiguity in the way that we talk about them. Whereas we get to digital endpoints, digital measures, digital biomarkers, um, there, a lot of people use these terms interchangeably. And what we're focusing on today, and why we have these two experts, Seth and Tarek, joining us, is really to take a look at as we get these digital measures and incorporate them into the life cycle of uh, life sciences, what are the things we need to be considering as far as the, the design and implementation? Uh, how do we bring these things in from an operational standpoint? And importantly, what are the regulatory considerations? Um, what do we need to make sure we're doing from a, uh, a validation and verification perspective? And ultimately, what will regulators and ultimately patients accept as these measures that we're developing? Um, so we have uh, Seth coming from, from Bioformis and Tarek uh, as well from Takeda, two expert speakers. So uh, what I'd like to do to kick this off is sort of set the stage here and look at the, the macrocosm of digital health. We, when we talk about these things and we hear about things coming up, we have uh, all the way from simple digital measures or the digital version of a traditional measure, leading its way then through digital biomarkers, digital endpoints, ePros, um, medical devices, software as a medical device, and SAMD. There's a whole range of things, and they have very different definitions um, and honestly very different purposes. So um, I'd like to hand it over to you guys kind of give us a run through of what is this world we're looking at of this set of measures. Sure, Thank, thanks, Doug. I'll, I'll kind of kick it off from the mid device, sort of this uh, terminology you hear a lot, SAMD or SAMD, um, and just kind of touch on, there's a wide range of uh, software as a medical device that's out there. They tend to run diagnostic to therapeutic. They run spectrum of aid, adjunct, and then the actual either therapeutic or measurement system. Um, and each one of them they go through um, many and different multitudes of ways that it can uh, be intended to use. 
uh, anything from clinical decision support systems to measurement systems that help aid in diagnosing uh, underlying disease or disease progression. So with that, I think um, one of the things we should also touch on is when you have a drug and a device combo, and maybe I'll hand that over to Tarek for his thoughts about how that is defined. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, in the drug and device combo space, I, I think it's a, it's a little interesting because you have to take into consideration the biologics of things and also the medical device of things. And, you know, there's this thing called a, a primary mode of action, which determines what drives the, the burden on evidence. Um, but I would also, as we talk through these, obviously, I think I want to highlight all of these applications are digital. All of them, I think, Doug, you put it nicely, probably have a different purpose. And at the same time, they all overlap, but they also have a have a substantial non-overlapping portion, which I think complicates everything. So there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of uniqueness as well. Um, and, and, and I don't know, Seth, if you want to start talking about the, uh, the other ones, like endpoints yeah. now or heroes, but... Right, so, so we got to have to decompose it is the way software always you know, sits at the requirements and you decompose down. And we start to think about patient reported outcomes, clinical um, outcome assessments, digital measurements. These are where we really start to see the traction begin, um, the interest begin, and really the, the engagement on the regulatory strategy. How do you start with the end in mind and how do you start to put those uh, concepts into practice. And, and I think from that perspective, we have to say, start looking at each one of them individually. Um, but probably the most important thing is, what are you trying to achieve and why? And this is really the heart of every engagement that um, we see around the start of uh, a discussion that involves some kind of digital measurement system. And many will say, I want a digital biomarker. Well, that's kind of an end goal in many ways. Um, and it's a great thing to want to do, but you have to think about the steps to get there and substantiating it over time and for the specific context of use. And so I'll take a pause here and step back and then really address um, the differences between a patient reported outcome versus a, a clinical assessment that's done um, through a digital system so that we have some clarity around that. Um, and, I, and I'll start with you know, the patient reported outcomes are pretty common to see uh, in digital platforms. Think about uh, a patient app that allows you to answer questions. We see that in our own medical care at this point. Uh, many of us have to answer questions to go see your physician. Uh, how are you feeling today? Have you done certain things? How much do you eat? What do you drink? That kind of fun stuff. All those things are patient reported outcome measurements and they're being used to understand your health, your mental wellness and other aspects of your life that may be stressors or may be exacerbators for certain underlying things that we may be concerned with from a healthcare perspective. Um, <clears throat> on the clinical assessments, I'll hand it over to Tarek on his thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, clinical assessments is also an interesting um... You know, when we look at COAs, right, they encompass a lot now. There's the, there's four of them, and I don't know if I can remember off the top of my head, but the PROs are one that there's the clinician determined outcomes where a clinician would look at certain attributes in score, for instance. Um, you know, in dermatology, for instance, they would look at the size of your plate or the redness, things like that. So it's still, an, it's the uh, clinician report outcome. There's performance outcomes and then there's an oh there's four of them so I, I did remember and then there's an observer reported outcome which would be more of a uh like a caregiver or not necessarily the patients but someone else um re reporting i think um COAs have been i think they're a little more mature than maybe some of the digital health technologies that are that have been trying to get into the space in the recent years However, they're not also at the point where they're accepted as primary or secondary endpoints most of the time, right? There's some cases where these things are be because there's no other way to measure. But um, I, I think it's an interesting world. I, I always see digital health, for instance, as, as just, uh, just like if I look at a transition, I see like COAs and then digital health with wearables and sensors. 
then I see all this other newer stuff coming up, right? Gen AIs and whatever of the world. So I kind of see like that spectrum there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's no, a can you, can you point. Raise a of, point. Yep, go ahead. Doug. I was gonna say an interesting point mm -hmm. of um, like it, really we need to think about, and I think you both kind of hit on this uh, of talking about the existing measures and their, what are used is thinking about the, the clinical need first. Like we always have to look at, like you said, Seth, not, oh, I want a digital biomarker, but I have a clinical need. I have a need for a measurement. Is there an existing measurement device, a measurement tool that will do this? Or do I need a new tool that will allow me to get this measurement for a specific need to measure a patient outcome or to measure a, a quality of life or things? So it's, I think, important to look at the, um, the why am I doing this, right? We start with the why. Why do I need this thing? And then we start looking at, at the how. So with the, uh, obviously expanding past the, some of the traditional measures, EPROs, ECOAs and things. If we then look at some of the new things that are coming about, digital biomarker obviously is a buzzword. Everyone's talking about them, yet very few, if anyone are actually doing them. Um, when we look at digital biomarkers, digital endpoints, some of the new tools that are coming about. Um, I'd like to get your thoughts about how those technologies are evolving, how we look at the, um, the, the intended use, context of use of these types of tools and what you're seeing. Yeah, so I'll start with um, in the drug development tools and then also in therapeutics, right? The behavioral health and sciences probably has some way of a foothold. We've seen some um, progression there, uh, especially in, in areas of depression or ADHD. There are several things out there that are taking, uh, I'll call it the, the digital version of the analog uh, preset in, in context. Um, many things now are moving forward on that front. And you still see um, like the Hamilton D rating scale for depression. And you now have a digital version of that. And now you're seeing actually advancement of uh, digital tools that can do a similar but different way of measuring that outcome. And, and then classifying and help personalizing, right, maybe your responsiveness to treatment, whether it be CBT or pharmaceutical or other aspects of things. I think is the physical sciences, I think hypertension or um, drugs that are treating other aspects of things, even oncology, we're starting to find uh, ways through the substantiation of that uh, measurement system. And, and now really coming into a composite world of indexes and other digital things that could be considered biomarkers over a longer period of substantiation mm -hmm. of these types of uh, validated outcomes. Um, and it takes a while to get there. So I'll, I'll pause there, Tarek, and have, hand the mic over to you. <laughs> yeah, I know. Thank, thank you, Seth. I think you touched upon really important points. I The, the way I view it too, I mean, being in this field for a while now, I think it stems maybe from the confusion a little bit, but the the end goal is to have a have an endpoint, right? A regulatory approved endpoint point in a in a pivotal trial. So that's everyone's endpoint. I think there's many many different ways of getting there, and there's many many um, efforts that are needed. Um, I, I I think when we say digital biomarkers, we also need to appreciate that especially I'm looking from a sensor point of view because that's where I, well, most of my work lies. But when I look from sensors, wearables, generating some sort of a, I want to say quote biomarker, unquote, I don't want to use the FDA definition yet when I say biomarker now, but just measuring something that's representative of the disease. I think there's nuances there because even that could end up being a COA, right? So then your endpoint could be a COA that you measure through a device, which may be intuitively you could think as a biomarker, but there's a very specific annotation to biomarkers and to get a, especially to get a qualified biomarker through a DDT is nearly impossible, right? There's, I mean, it's very hard, let's say. There's the there's the statistical criteria called Prentice criteria, satisfy, there's a lot of different things. Um, so I think even on the limited cases where it's been successful, it's been a long journey, like Seth said. I think there's, there's other paths, right? You can just do it through your drug programs. You can do it as part of your IND. So it's there's many, many different paths to get to a digital point. And 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 back to just just circling back, right? To Doug, where you started, it should all this should all be 
determined 100% from the need, right? What is the clinical need? Uh, it should never be, and this is like, a, even when you follow consortiums like Dime, it's in their first slide, I guess. You should never say, oh, I have this cool tech and why don't I put it on trial? No, like that that's a no-no. You should always start with, what am I trying to measure? Um, how have others measured it? And now how do I get there? Um, and that's going to answer, try and help answer a lot of the, a lot of the questions. I think industry overall has moved a lot in the last year. So I don't think any, I, I don't know. I, from my point of view, I don't think anyone is doing, I have a cool watch, let's put it in anymore. I hope so. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we passed that state. So we're more in a realistic, how do we make a different state, which is good news, but it also comes with a lot of responsibility because you know, putting a watch to trial is one thing, but getting a getting an approved endpoint is a whole different um, different ball game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that brings something to mind. Um, as these companies get more comfortable putting the tech into a clinical trial, looking at exactly how that's incorporated and what things are tied together uh, um, for a specific digital measure. If we're developing or validating uh, a new a new endpoint, a new biomarker. Um, there's there's a trap potentially of tying that tech too closely to a compound or to a drug where essentially their their fates are linked. Um, so I'm curious to get your thoughts of the the give and take of either tying tying the tech tying the measure to a specific compound or program as opposed to having these things complementary but separate. I, I can start on our experience has just been um, be careful what you wish for, uh, because you just might get it, as they say. Um, there's some nuances, right, in developing something so tightly that it's part of your safety system or part of your um, eff efficacy system of the therapeutic. And at the end of the story, when you go to market it, it will become part of the contingency in terms of and conditions, so to speak, um, and the labeling, probably the most aspect uh, that you have to worry about. And, it, and now you have to distribute it together, right? Because it's a combination device and therapeutic type product. Um, and with that comes a lot of uh, other hurdles that you may never have imagined where you're trying to understand how you're going to get that technology and wireless and all of these things that are necessary to a cell phone and an interface and 24-7, you know, uplink and reliability on IT networks all over the world. I, I just don't know if that's necessarily what you want to do or what you intended to do. Now, um, with that, there are can be other ways to maybe find the complementary space and work with in your own um, confines of you know doing the development uh, naturally in a vertical setting inside a pharmaceutical company or a biologics company, um, or you can partner with an outside source that has similar interests and help combine different needs that are very similar on the assets that you're developing. I'll pause there and yeah. You know, yeah, Tarek, I'd like to get your, your thoughts there as we uh, look from the, the pharma perspective of how do we look at this from a, a partnership angle and developing a multi-year, multi-asset strategy? Uh, yeah, no, I, I think that's one of the learnings I'm also experiencing is that if you tie specific technologies to specific assets or, or even trials, you run the incredible risk of um, neither of them succeeding, right? Because as we know, many clinical trials don't make it to the next stage. Some do, right? Depends on the phase. Um, and, and with digital technologies, I think we should be honest to ourselves. And there's still no digital endpoint that's approved that to, to our liking, right? I think there's this Duchenne SV95, which which even that got an EMA, yeah, it's a primary endpoint, but if you read the footnotes, it still says, provided your secondary ones are also useful. So there's there's still a lot of, um, I, I guess, a lot of potential energy that needs to be turned into something real. Um, and I think, again, even with that endpoint, no drug has been approved at the end of the day. So I think what I'm trying to say is there's also a lot of risk on the digital side. So I think if you start if you do not have a multi-asset, multi-strategy, maybe multi-company, right? We're talking about consortia now and 
strategy, I think you're going to end up in a very, very high risk and low chance of success environment where you might not want to be. I think there's also a lot of drivers from, it goes back to a little bit, my first comment, if you're trying to do a DDT, if you're trying to do a broader endpoint outside of your asset, I think this is almost a requirement. You can't do it by yourself. You're going to need multiple trials, multiple stakeholders, multiple KOLs, multiple publications. So I, it's almost like a, 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 a table stakes. And now if you're doing like, if you're a pharma company who has a really strong pipeline in a certain disease area year after year after year after year, I can see a use case where you want to develop it yourself. Um, but again, I, I don't know how much of the industry is like that versus, you know, a lot of nowadays, especially we see a lot of companies dropping their rare disease portfolio entirely, things like that, right? So it, it's really a, depends on the business strategy, the, 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 the clinical need for each specific assets, but also the, the, the overall continuity of that specific clinical um, area. Yeah. yeah, so let's let's drill down on that a little bit. Uh, basically the thought of the success of these digital endpoints in, in broad use really depends then on open source collaboration and scalability and reuse of these types of measures. Um, I know that it, we have the consortiums like Dime um, and some others out there that run a lot of pre-competitive programs, bringing together experts in industry, both uh, pharma and tech and regulatory. And even it looks like some that aren't traditionally in the life science industry, but as we get more into technology, there is a lot of expertise outside of the traditional life science companies that, that we can really get knowledge from. Um, so I guess we'll start with, with Seth on that as we look at some of that open source collaboration, uh, the consortiums that we see, whether they be the public-private consortiums like Dime or even some of the private consortiums we see popping up uh, with a specific build or specific purpose. Where do those fit in? Well, they fit in right up front in my mind, right? So defining the user needs, defining what is necessary can also be shaped and formed by multiple insights, multiple opinions, multiple needs. Really, if you think about it, they could be very similar. They can converge on, I'll pick a couple of vitals, right? Heart rate, respiration rate, SpO2. You have a whole swath of disease states that you could use with that. Now, what's interesting from there is then all of the um, ecosystems that the, each team member brings with them whether they have uh, universities and other institutions that do research, that can support a tremendous amount of clinical validation and clinical insight that can bring forth um, a culmination and a partnership through collaboration, some great opportunities to learn and to develop and to succeed on so many of these uh, efforts that if you're doing it by yourself, you're so limited. You're so limited about what the context is within your own company versus, okay, broaden it out and then pick one disease state that's being addressed in multiple ways, right? Mm -hmm. And that that allows you to then have a bit more of a landscape to look at what is maybe the first step, you know, what could be the beachhead that you could land on from a reg strategy and start working down the pathway of, hey, I want to do a measurement system and it has to be this accurate. And if I have this accuracy for measuring hypertension on a blood pressure scale and it and it can see things that we've never seen before, maybe I can use that for a broader scale in cardiovascular disease. So we're, we're trying to look for, as Tarek was saying, right, ways that you're going to diversify that portfolio and really do development work that has meaning to support multiple phases of human intervention through a pharmaceutical or biologic or even, you know, digital technologies that can help substantiate change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Tarek, from, uh, from the pharma perspective, I know like, pharma has always been obviously rightly so very protective of their intellectual property mm -hmm. and uh, you know, your data is your data and there is hesitancy in any essential data from one company being shared or released externally. Now, in, when we get into some of these, you know, collaborations and consortiums, one of the benefits is, especially benefit we could see in the rare disease space you were mentioning, of um, 
a lot of times that it's hard just to get enough data in order to get the validation verification, be able to show that this thing, this measure can work at a broad scale. Yet the collaboration and bringing together of data, essentially cross company, cross industry, is a way that we can get huge volumes to have these machine learning type algorithms and tools run. So what, what are your thoughts on how we can move that forward as an industry? I mean, it's, it's, it's very different from company to company. I think a lot of the strategies are also uh, not very well defined in terms of IP. Now, when I was in the med, med tech, med device world, the, it's very clear, right? If you protect your IP, you protect your approach, Mm -hmm. um so you you have your uh, right to practice so someone doesn't ip your technology before you and now you can't you can't sell it i think um in in especially the digital health world my experience is it's a complete unknown no one knows if these things are ipable to begin with i mean anything you can file a patent get the patent the pro the question is can you protect it in court if someone challenges it mm -hmm. um and i don't think there's been any precedent so no one knows really um, I, I know some companies are trying to IP digital approaches and some think that that's not a great use of time. Um, so uh, and again, back to like, if it's a DDT, I almost feel like it, it direct development tool, it almost defeats the purpose. Like you're almost going to create a roadblock for yourself because I think you need to show publications, you need to show collaboration, you need to show multiple trials you know, there's a, there's a lot of emphasis on having independent validation sets, right? That you did not um, you, you even maybe go prospectively and, and go with an hypothesis, even in the digital health domain, rather than, um, you know, do everything retrospectively. So I think in my mind, and, and maybe it's an ideal world that doesn't exist, but I think we're moving towards this collaborative space more than other way. I think there's also a lot of new tools coming up, right? Like in, in the AI world, there's this thing called federated learning. So they're actually looking at, can I share my data without sharing my data? So you you can you can get, a, get an AI model that's health trained from company A. You're not seeing their data, you just have the model. Now you're sharing the model, but you can fine tune it with your own data and then send it back to the company C, I guess. And if there's three companies working on this, now you can have a maybe a collaboratively built shared model, but everyone's data is still safe. But people are also going to token IDs and combining at the same time, right? So I think it, right. it's right. kind of an interesting thing. I think it's also a political, global thing that over time will, will need to be answered. It's it's a very uh, multi-layered challenge, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the bottom line sounds like is that the science has to be there, right? We As we get whatever the model will be, whatever the data needs to be, we need to be able to prove that the science is there in order to really get these moved forward, uh, which brings up the interesting aspect of when we now talk about the regulatory agencies, whether it be the FDA or the EMA, that um, you know, they have their own requirements and what they want to see. And oftentimes, if we're bringing something through, they want to see all of the data. Um, and if we're just looking at, well, there was an AI model that was used, and it should, they're like, well, but you know, we need to see the data. So I'm curious to get your aspects now. Um, both number one, what are the regulators looking for, and number two. How does that mindset and how can the regulatory agencies shift and adjust in order to make this type of thing a reality? Yeah, great, great question. I guess I'll I'll kind of lean in first on um, experiences that we've had recently. Even um, yes, the the data is essential. The data is is extremely important, especially in submissions. The disinclusion or the discard of data is even probably more important than the ones that you included, but the reasons and the rationales behind it. But mm -hmm. again, stepping back, right? The, the science has to be there, starting with the end in mind. Early and often engagement, right? You, you have to go seek some opinion and ensure that you're aligned as a team, right? You're forming a relationship with the agencies and you're doing it under many different programs and they're opening up more and more of these programs, whether it be pre-sub through um, a, a, let's call it a medical device you know, path or a DDT pre-discussion. Pre they've opened up iStand, which is a new way of handling um, 
measurement systems and unique ways of looking at drug development. Uh, CHMP under EMEA uh, ends up having a lot of similar discussions early and often, again, on um, advisories versus opinions. Uh, you, you have to engage them. You have to bring some pilot data. Please don't come with no data because it's a kind of a moot point in theoretical discussion. So at least have some studies retrospectively analyze data sets that you've been given if you're doing AI classification models walk in there realizing, right, you, you have to understand risk reward. You, you can't approach this with just because I can measure it, it's great, right? But how accurately, how repeatable, under what context, all of these things come up. Be, be very, very, um, I guess, committed to, right, the the right way forward. The, the formulaic aspects of this are all in those um, discussion guides. They, they basically tell you the topics they want you to talk to them about, right? And going in there, be respectful, right? This is very, very busy people as you are too. And, and you're connecting with clinical leads, technical leads, statistical leads, mm -hmm. and you better have a plan worked out and, and data management and SAP and understand, you know, the ins and outs of the clinical aspects of this. The higher the risk, the more certain these measurements have to be. And you really can't just wing it, right? And you can't say, Somewhere in that 50 to 60% range is good enough. I, I don't know that it will be for things that are critical to care. And maybe it's okay if you want to relate something early prognosis or of interest in a, in a wearable that might be a wellness device to a more serious way of diagnosing AFib, I'll, I'll pick on, right? Which you've seen some watches out there that can do some great work with that, but you know they have to start low and then they have to build the credible evidence up over time. So all of these things follow a very, very similar trajectory. Um, and you're in it for the long haul. I mean, I really I really think people have to understand it's not an overnight discussion. It's it's 18, 24 months, three years. In some cases, it could be five. Right. And, and I don't want to temper the enthusiasm, but it's not overnight success. So I'll, I'll hand it off to Tarek on that note. Yeah, I've actually been um, I've been pretty impressed by the regulatory bodies, right? To to be frank here, because I think they've been very accommodative. They're they're trying a lot of different ways. They are, I think, bottom line, they're willing to work with 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 the technology developers. So like that that's great. They're not closing the doors. There's so many different ways. Um, they, like Seth mentioned them, they they have they even have like a rare disease one, rare disease endpoint advancement, RDA, another one that they, they, so they have a lot of pilots, and, and now they just have a funding program, for instance, for digital health technologies. Um I, I think they're open to it. They have, they're they're opening these digital health centers. Um, so it's only gonna get better, I think. There, there's and I and I also think from a technical background, none of the stuff they're asking is new, right? Like I just want to make sure. Nothing we do in digital health is like newly discovered science. This is this is fundamental science that has been applied to you know biostats. It's been applied to COAs, and now it's being applied to digital health. So regulatory bodies are being very consistent as they should be. Uh, it's all it's all following the science. You need to provide this this this, which you always have to provide before as well. So yes, there's a new burdens because you're. I don't know, remotely collecting data. So now maybe you have to worry about things you didn't before. But at the end of it, you still need a good, robust measure, good test, retest. You want sensitivity to change. You need to define a minimum clinically important difference. Again, none of these are new, right? Um, as they shouldn't be. So I, I think, I think, I think regulatory bodies are doing a good job. I think what's really missing, the missing link for everyone, for industry, for I think regulatory, for even patients, you can think about it, is just a success story, right? Unless there's a success story, everything is a philosophical discussion. And I think we just need to get to that point and everyone is trying and to Seth's point, it might take, you know, two years, three years, five years, hopefully not, but um, because we have, if we have spent some of that time in the past at this point, I think, I think that that will be that, in my mind, that will unlock so much more progress that's visible. Obviously there's a lot of progress, right? But it's very hard to, name it or see it i think once you have an approved endpoint once let's say x disease has an approved endpoint in a pivotal trial that's going to unlock so many other people working on that disease now using that 
So I think it's going to be this exponential thing. We just haven't hit the the, the threshold yet. It's it, it's it's hopefully a matter of time, right? Like in any other technology space. Right. And well, I'm curious to get if, if either of you have thoughts of what can the regulatory bodies do to facilitate or even beyond facilitate to incentivize um, that that movement and that progress? Yeah, so great question. I think there are grants and there's uh, programs that you can apply to for innovative science used for many different uh, disease states and disease state progression. Um, beyond the grants, they also do collaborative efforts. They work with uh, consortiums they help weigh in on those consortiums as to the direction that you know might be beneficial to both sides of the, the party on the regulator side and the, the commercial side um and then i think the i had a third in my head now <laughs> i'll hand it to you Tara, because i can't remember what the third one is uh, yeah it will come to you it happens to me too all the time now um yeah, I mean, what can they do? I, I again, I don't think there's like I I don't feel like it's a regulatory issue. You know what I mean? Like that's my challenge a little bit in these discussions because this comes up a lot, and I think it's human nature. It's more of a well, it's just like the the, the bar is too high. I I don't necessarily agree personally with that. I think the bar has always been hard high. It's just the same bar. It's just a different technology, different approach that has to now go through that bar, which to me is how it should be. I think. But it, when I think as a scientist and as, as an, I, I guess if I put my ideal world hat, I think wouldn't it be amazing if like there was a list of, I mean, the diseases aren't mostly changing, right? It's the same diseases we're after. The, the measures aren't really changing. So I think eventually as a society, we need to converge into, okay, these are the measures for this disease that's, that's going to help. And maybe we should also talk about the ones that will not help. I think that's, you know, that always comes up in, in discussions, but we've tried a lot of things. So wouldn't it be great to know what did not work so we don't keep trying it? I think like, yeah. like I'm thinking if I was a, if I'm running a trial and I put in a technology that maybe the regulatory body knows that three others tried, I would think for the patients, wouldn't it be good to get, I, I don't know, it's a strong word. I don't want to say don't allow it, but at least give that information back saying, what are you going to do differently? Because we have evidence this was not too helpful and maybe you need to do a burden trade-off, right? Maybe it's not a big deal, but I, it, even that discussion I think could, could be interesting um, moving forward, especially because um, we are throwing a lot of new technologies and there is a burden aspect that, that cannot be um, minimized. So, so I will add now I figure out my third. Ah, there you go. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it picks right up from where you left off. And and I think there's there's a there's a precedence, obviously, that you know we're all following, we're trying to build off of what the last scientific uh achievement, I'll call it, right? When when, if you will, and with that precedence, that becomes the standard of care, the standard of diagnosis, the standard of measurement, right? And that standard of measurement over time. Right, can be changed. Right, we've gone from simple microscopes to electron microscopes to telescopes that can see the other side of the the universe. At this point, right, we're seeing things for the first time we've never seen before. So it's not uncommon to think I may have a better way to measure this. And unfortunately, the first step is you got to compare yourself to the standard. Right. So at times, I would say if there was a way to say, could you just pause on the, the standard of care and listen to what this science says in, in retrospect of, I, I don't know, scientific rigor, uh, that could be another way to do it, right? And, and then work with us on that. And that is what we're starting to see, some promise of opening their eyes and ears as regulators and not be so conservative that we're going to stifle innovation, but allow some of that to happen in exploratory endpoints, some of that to happen in ways that we'll work with each other and try to prove right out that the new measurement system is as accurate or could be even more accurate. There are phenomenons out there that are so entangled with uh, a self-reported non-objective way of measurement. And I'll pick on pain for a second because it's something we've looked at at Achille, or sorry, at a bioformis and figuring out how do you deal with measuring it when it's so subjectively reported? Mm -hmm. 
right? That you have to think of ways at times and then challenge the status quo and ask for some leeway that, that allows you to grow a bit as a community. And I don't think you're going to get a, a win overnight. And I wouldn't really want one, to be honest, because of the, the let's say, the downside of getting it wrong, right? But at least have that open discussion and and at least right, try to advance it so that others can build off of that as well. And at, at any time in a an inflection point of an industry or a technology, challenging the status quo is what's required, right? That's how we make change and we make progress. Uh, and I'm sure that as, as these technologies mature, as these types of new digital measures become more prevalent, the specific competition between companies and between technologies will likely increase. But it, I feel like at this point, what's really important is that collaboration piece of everyone coming together and moving the entire body of work forward. The, you know, the competition will come. Let's not artificially put competition that creates a barrier, right? Yeah. So kind of as um, uh, a parting thought there for me and a, a, a takeaway, I'm curious to get, when we think about then, um, those types of collaborations are gonna be essential. So uh, I'll start with, with Seth here. Of when you look at those collaborations and the collaboration between a, uh, a digital health company like Bioformis and a pharmaceutical partner, um, what is something that you think or you would want this pharmaceutical partner to know about what we need to do from the technology perspective in order to advance the science and advance the technology? Yeah, no, I, I think um, kind of what we've discussed throughout this, but you know, to start with the end in mind, but be very, very open to the end to end process of discovery, right? Whether it be, we have certain tools and insight into those tools of how we might be able to assist, um, but there are trade-offs in every one of these decisions that get made, and there are different paths that can be taken. So you're, you're establishing some trust between the two entities and sharing openly, again, um, either one-on-one -on -one or in collaboration of a larger effort in a consortium. And be mindful that right, you're going to need to understand the why and the how over time. And you have to prove it out to each other that that is the right path, that you are de-risking the proposition as you continue through the, the pathway to eventually hand over a measurement system or a biomarker or a device that can be used to aid a disease state, somebody really in need. Um, and sometimes you have to prioritize them a little differently than maybe you wanted to in the sense for maybe you commercialize the product and make some um, profit back to invest back into the studies that are going to be needed, right? To substantiate mm -hmm. a biomarker. Um, there's a very broad context in that early part that then gets to a very specific context in the later part that requires more and more and more data under certain conditions and certain variabilities to allow it to be a marker, right? And, and that end state of markers are then allowing things that we all can then norm, normalize on and understand, hey, if I'll give you a number on your LDL score, you probably know what a 100 versus a 130 versus a 160 is. Mm -hmm. right? You're either in trouble or you're not in trouble, right? In, in that full range, everybody understands that. Why? Because that's a biomarker we've had since the 70s, probably earlier than that, but that's when it got com commercialized. When you get to that level of understanding of measurement systems and then that credibility of a biomarker, it's it's amazing, especially if you're in disease states that are progressing very quickly mm -hmm. and people have very limited time to use decisions to then interfere and help turn that around, right? So I'll hand that off back to you. And <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks, Seth. Thanks, Seth. That was great. Um, and Tarek, to you, kind of the, the flip side of that question, as we more of these partnerships are established and we start advancing the science, what's the, the one thing you would want your digital health technology uh, partner to know or understand about pharma's motivations? I think it's really imperative that a partner understands the need. Uh, I think we keep going back to need, but the need is different for every single actor here, um, the player here. I think like when we want to partner with someone, 
like in the device world, you'll see a lot of companies that have a device that is 510k cleared in a healthy volunteer and sometimes not even, right? Um, they'll come out and they think they're ready to go, right? I, I, it's, I, I think there's a, this, and that's not a great sign. Like you really want someone who knows, who understands end to end what a clinical trial does versus what a, what a, again, SAMD or a med device or whatever you're offering does. Cause it, it's not the same. Um, it's completely different worlds. Um, I think that that knowledge, that understanding, and ideally experience having gone through it a couple of times is, is really important when we look for partners. Um, like technology is just a, one little part of the whole chain, right? There's so many different things that are that are important. The patient burden again, the the privacy, the the quality of the data, obviously. But usually it's not like the tech. The technologies are usually very again, very, I don't want to say mature, but like for, for, for measuring what they want to measure, they've been out there, right? Like everyone's using a PPG sensor. Everyone's using like, there's, I don't want to minimize that work. Obviously it's amazing work, but it, it has been out there for a while. I don't think the technologies are going to move the needle here at this point. It's more of that entire end to end understanding both high level regulatory and like um, how to get to an end point, but also a little bit on the, pharma side of things how do you run a clinical trial how do you train the sites how do i make sure I, i'm not adding another phone to the site's burden and like most of the time surprisingly that you would assume that understanding is there but it, it's not um so i, I think partners who want to get into the pharma space is a choice right no one's forcing anyone to get if they want to get into pharma space i think they need to do their homework understand these nuances and understand that this is not this is different than uh, a five ten k clearance or 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 having an app on a phone. Um. No, it's great. Thanks, Tarek, um, and thank you, Seth, as well. I think that was a, a great discussion, and we we covered a lot of ground. Um, so with that, I'd like to hand it back over to Janelle here to close us out. Yeah, thank you for that insightful presentation. It looks like we've run out of time for today's session, but I'd like to thank our speakers, Seth and Tarek, as well as Doug for guiding the discussion, and of course, our sponsor, Bioformis, for making this event possible. On behalf of Bioformis and Sightline, I hope you have a productive remainder of the day, and thank you for watching.